Welcome to the Special Forces in World War II podcast, transmitting on this frequency. This broadcast is your dedicated channel for comprehensive intelligence regarding World War II Special Forces operations. Our transmissions encompass in-depth analysis of their strategic maneuvers, cutting-edge equipment, illustrious biographies, and an array of pertinent subjects. The orchestration of these transmissions is executed by the expert team of the Special Forces in World War II website, a squad deeply immersed in the historical theater. For further insights, visual aids, and captured moments frozen in time, navigate to our virtual headquarters at worldwar2-soft.com. Your immersion into the front lines of knowledge awaits. Over and out. Welcome to our special two-part episode of Unternehmen Wrestlesprung on the Special Forces in World War II podcast. Today, we are focusing on part two of the fascinating two-part series about Unternehmen Wrestlesprung. In our last episode, we meticulously outlined the preparations for this audacious mission to capture the Yugoslav partisan leader, Joseph Broz Tito. Today, we dive into the heart of the operation itself, exploring its execution and the profound consequences that followed. As we pick up from where we left off, the stage is set in the rugged terrains of Yugoslavia. The German forces, equipped with detailed plans and backed by elite units like the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500, embark on their mission. But as we will uncover, the challenges they face are formidable. The partisans, led by Tito, are not just a ragtag group of rebels. They are a highly motivated, well-organized resistance movement prepared to defend their command and leader at all costs. In this episode, we'll navigate through the intense clashes and strategic maneuvers that define Unternehmen Rüsselsprung. You'll hear about the unexpected turns, the fierce resistance by the partisans, and the resilience on both sides of the conflict. We'll analyze the outcomes of the operation, discussing how it impacted the Axis power's position in the Balkans and the broader implications for the war. As we conclude this two-part series, we aim to provide not just a recount of events, but an understanding of the operation's significance in the broader context of World War II. So, join us as we delve deeper into Unternehmen Rüsselsprung, a military operation that is as controversial as it is captivating. Let's continue our journey back to 1944, revealing the dramatic events of Unternehmen Rüsselsprung, capturing Tito, the 25th of May, 1944. At exactly 6.30, Unternehmen Rüsselsprung starts with a surprise bombing attack by Heinkel 46 and Henschel 126 light attack aircraft from Stab 1 and 2 of the Nachtschlachtgruppe 7. These aircraft skillfully approach their targets at low altitude, evading detection. In the second wave, the city center of Dovar is targeted by Junkers 87 D2 bombers from the second Gruppe of Schlachtgeschwader 151, deploying powerful 125 kilogram and 250 kilogram bombs. By 650, the third wave of attacks is underway, executed by the dive bombers of the 13th Group of Schlachtgeschwader 151, continuing until 655. This is immediately followed by the fourth and final assault, conducted by the third group of Nachtschlachtgruppe 7, using Italian CR-42 aircraft, which lasts until 7 o'clock. 
The dive bombers and attack aircraft receive cover from Messerschmitt Bf 109 G4 fighters of Gruppe 4 of Jagdgeschwader 27. At 7 o'clock sharp, the first Junkers 52 transport aircraft appear above Dulva, dropping 314 Fallschirmjäger from the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500. By 7.10, the initial group of 45 DFS-230 airborne gliders lands, delivering an additional 340 Fallschirmjäger. The first wave intended to deploy 654 Fallschirmjäger. However, some gliders are infiltrated by partisans, leading to one being detached from its tow and forced to land outside Derva, while two others are shot down, and three suffer damage. Several gliders deviate significantly from their planned landing zones. One lands near the Bastasi Cave, about seven kilometers west of Duva, and others in a locality called Vertoce near Durva. The Fallschirmjäger from the glider in Bastasi face immediate confrontation and are killed by the Tito Escort Battalion. The Fallschirmjäger in Vertoce engage in combat and begin their push towards Durva. In total, 20 crew and Fallschirmjäger are lost in these incidents. During the landing, Junkers Ju-87 dive bombers conduct ground suppression in the Durva area, effectively driving the defenders into cover with machine gun fire. The coordination of these aerial operations is managed from a mobile command center, likely aboard a Junker Ju-88 or a Heinkel 111, simultaneously with the airborne assault a ground offensive by approximately 20,000 German troops begins, aiming to dismantle the Taito-led state in Durva. Fierce battles erupt across all nine areas of the German advance. The group known as William launches an attack from SRBA, intending to reach Durva by the evening of the 25th of May, 1944, to assist the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500. After successfully landing, the paratroopers regroup and move towards their designated targets. Gruppe Panther, aided by Gruppe Rot, faces minimal resistance advancing towards the cemetery, where their commander, Ribka, sets up headquarters. However, they find no trace of Tito or his headquarters. Gruppe Greifer, Stürmer, Brecher and Beisser also find their targets evacuated, as the Allied military missions had relocated following aerial reconnaissance on the 23rd of May, 1944. Gruppe Stürmer faces a unique challenge, landing in a field just south of the Dravar cave and coming under fire from the Tito Escort Battalion. Meanwhile, Gruppe Draufgänger successfully lands at the Western Cross location and assaults a building thought to be the Partisan Communications Center, which turns out to be the Communist Party of Yugoslavia Central Committee's office. After fierce resistance, the building is destroyed with satchel charges. Gruppenblau and Grun, comprised of Fallschirmjäger who landed by parachute, engage in intense combat in eastern Durva, which is densely populated. Derva had recently hosted a conference of the Young Communist League of Yugoslavia, with many attendees still in the town. Consequently, numerous youths arm themselves and fight against the Fallschirmjäger, attempting to establish a cordon. With the German occupation of Derva, it becomes apparent that the main positions of the partisans are across the Unak River, where Tito is believed to be. Although the Germans receive information about Tito's headquarters being in a cave on Mount Gradina, its exact location remains undisclosed. Following the successful parachute jump and landing by the Germans, led by battalion commander Hauptsturmführer Kurt Ribke, the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500 proceeds as per their strategic plan. Kampfgruppe Greifer moves towards the Zitadel, engaging in intense defensive battles with the enemy. Between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, a series of attacks are launched by the Fallschirmjäger along Durvar's main street, targeting the positions held by a security battalion and reinforced by officers from Shipovlian. 
The partisan positions are heavily bombarded by a Fallschirmjäger battery equipped with Krupp's LG 4075mm gun and two batteries of 50mm mortars. However, the German assault faces stiff resistance, leading to a retreat to houses on the outskirts of Davar and a temporary lull in the battle. Simultaneously, Tito's supreme headquarters orchestrates the cave's defense and communicates with officer cadets training approximately 1.5 kilometers from Davar by messengers. As the Germans intensify their focus on the cave, more than a hundred officer cadets join the fight around eight o'clock, thwarting a potential German flank attack on the headquarters. Urgent commands are relayed by telephone from the headquarters to the 5th Corps and the 1st Division, ordering them to halt the German advance from Jaichi and Bihak towards Davar. The Supreme Staff urgently advises Marshal Tito to evacuate the cave and relocate to a safer position. Tito, accompanied only by his adjutant and a few close associates, remains near the cave while the Supreme Staff and its chief are located nearby. With radio communication disrupted, messengers become the sole means of communication. The headquarters repeatedly urges Tito to vacate the cave, with official records noting attempts to persuade him at 9.30, 9.45 and 10 o'clock. Tito decides to leave only after 10 o'clock, recognizing the danger of staying. During this period, the Supreme Headquarters dispatches messengers to nearby units to clarify the situation in Davar and update on the Supreme Commander's status. These orders, issued directly by the Supreme Headquarters and not on behalf of Tito, indicate independent actions taken by the Headquarters. Hauptsturmführer Ribka faces the decision to deploy a second wave of 171 Fallschirmjäger directly above the Tito cave, potentially blocking the retreat route. The rationale behind his decision is unclear. He may have realized the German offensive in Dava was not progressing as expected, with partisan reinforcements on the way. Communication disruptions with higher headquarters could have prevented him from adjusting the initial plan. Once radio communication is re-established, the Fallschirmjäger are forced to defend against partisan counterattacks, requiring all available forces to concentrate in Davar rather than on the opposite side of the river. Additionally, Ribka's uncertainty about Tito's presence in the cave may have influenced his decision to adopt a more defensive stance. By 10 o'clock, German forces have taken control over Durvar. In the fierce battles, the partisans suffer significant losses, with approximately 100 soldiers reported dead. Additionally, several members of foreign military missions are either killed or captured. The Fallschirmjäger, on the other hand, incur 60 casualties during this phase of the operation. Inside the Druvar cave, only Tito, Arso Jovanovic, Alexander Rankovic, Veliko Dragicevic, and General Sretan Zujevic remain. During the confrontation, Veliko Dragicevic, chief of the liaison department of the Supreme Staff, is killed, and the entire radio telegraphy base is destroyed. As a result, Generals Rankovic and Jovanovic switch to using couriers for all communications with the operational headquarters of the NOV and POJ. The German forces capture most of the partisan radio stations and obtain numerous cipher documents, severely disrupting partisan communication lines. While many partisans are either killed or captured, a considerable number manage to evade this fate. Meanwhile, Tito and his group devise an ingenious escape plan from the cave. They create an opening in the floor of a hut and use ropes from parachute lines to descend. Despite some casualties during the escape, Tito successfully navigates through a narrow crevice, avoiding enemy fire, and directs his security battalion from behind a large rock. By 12 o'clock, Tito reaches the summit of Mount Gradina and joins a partisan group led by Rankovic. 
They then proceed towards Padovi, where they join the surviving Allied military missions, concealing themselves in the area. The headquarters of the 1st Proletarian Corps in Mokronoga quickly responds to the German landing, sending the 6th Proletarian Division's 3rd Lyca Brigade, consisting of four battalions, to Durava. The 1st Dalmatian Brigade and two battalions from the 1st Proletarian Lyca Brigade also join the effort, totaling about 1,000 partisans who undertake a forced march to Durva. Intense urban combat ensues in Deva, with little regard for civilian safety. The Fallschirmjäger, supported by combat aircraft, seize control of the town around noon. However, they are soon engaged in fierce clashes with the arriving partisan units. Despite the Germans establishing defensive positions and receiving reinforcements, the partisans launch counterattacks, gradually pushing the Germans back. As the battle continues, the situation becomes increasingly dire for the German forces, surrounded and under constant assault from the partisans. By 11.30, the 1st Battalion of the 3rd Lyca Brigade, numbering 130 soldiers, reaches the heights near the village of Kamenites. They immediately launch an assault on the German positions at the Stavkowitz railway station. In the ensuing skirmish, the Germans suffer seven fatalities and a dozen wounded, forcing them to retreat to the nearby cemetery. Around this time, the second wave of the German operation lands. Despite ongoing attacks and counterattacks in the rocky terrain near Kamenich, neither side secures a definitive victory. However, the Germans are pushed into a defensive position. The partisans from the 3rd Lika Brigade are joined by groups and individual soldiers from an engineering brigade and various units of the NOV and POJ, National Liberation Army of Yugoslavia, who manage to break out of Durvar. The partisan positions are targeted by repeated German airstrikes. Around 13 o'clock, the 3rd Battalion of the 6th Lika Division, led by the division commander, arrives in Durvar. They immediately attack the German positions in the Javar Valley, with different companies taking strategic routes to bolster the partisan defence. The German forces are compelled to strengthen their defence in response to these advances. The first battles begin around 14 o'clock. The second company of the 3rd Leica Battalion uses mortar fire to neutralise German machine gun nests, pushing the Germans to the central intersection of Bastasi Street by 1640. Intense fighting results in the council building changing hands multiple times. Eventually, these Germans are also forced to retreat to the Shobich Glavica Cemetery. Close to 1645, the Partisan Security Battalion successfully expels the Germans from the right bank of the Unak River and crosses to the opposite side. The arrival of the 1st Battalion of the 1st Proletarian Brigade further bolsters the partisan forces. The 2nd Battalion of the 3rd Lika Brigade attacks the Germans' left flank, driving Gruppe Brecher from their positions. The 4th Battalion of the 3rd Lika Brigade arrives in Durva around 17 o'clock, remaining in reserve in case of additional German landings. At 18 o'clock, Battalion Commander Ribka wounded in the fighting, is evacuated in a Fiesler Storch aircraft, initially intended for flying out Tito when captured. Command is subsequently assumed by Captain Bentrup from the 1st Fallschirmjäger Regiment. He orders a retreat to Durva, where most German forces entrench themselves on the hill of the Schobitz glavica Cemetery. The Germans enlist residents for tasks such as digging trenches and gathering ammunition. The Shobich glavica Cemetery, fortified on two sides with a stone wall, becomes the primary defensive position for the Fallschirmjäger, serving as their command post, ammunition storage and medical station. By 20 o'clock, most of the Fallschirmjäger are pushed back to the Shobich glavica Cemetery area. Barriers established by the Fallschirmjäger on Durvar's main street are also forced to withdraw 
by 2130. Meanwhile, German aircraft successfully deliver ammunition to the remaining German-held positions. The Germans fortify their position at the schobitz glavitza Cemetery, which becomes the focal point of their defence. Concrete walls protect the cemetery and trenches are dug for defence. The Germans, now surrounded by four battalions of the 3rd Leica Brigade and the 3rd Dalmatian Battalion, prepare for the ongoing assault. At 23 o'clock, the partisans launch a coordinated attack from all directions, supported by mortar fire. The Germans respond with illumination flares and heavy automatic weapons fire, repelling the initial assault. This marks a crucial phase in the battle for Durvar, demonstrating the intensity and scale of the conflict. The 26th of May, 1944 Throughout the night, the Fallschirmjäger positions at the cemetery in Durva face relentless attacks from the four battalions of the 3rd Lika Brigade and the 9th Dalmatian Division. Despite the intensity of these assaults, the Fallschirmjäger managed to hold their ground. Around one o'clock, a coordinated attack led by the 3rd and 4th battalions of the 3rd Lika Brigade using mortars and hand grenades is launched but fails to penetrate the German defences. German counterattacks are noted in some areas. This pattern repeats in subsequent assaults, including one by the 1st Battalion of the 1st Proletarian Lika Brigade around 2 o'clock and another attempt at 3.30, both of which are repelled by the Fallschirmjäger. These repeated attacks inflict considerable casualties on the German forces. During the peak of the fighting, a partisan group momentarily breaches the German defensive ring, but is quickly neutralized in a counterattack. As dawn approaches, the partisans are forced to retreat due to the looming threat of German airstrikes. At 7 o'clock, 12 Junker 52 aircraft successfully airdrop critical supplies, especially ammunition, to the besieged German troops. In response to intelligence about a possible breakthrough of the 92nd Grenadier Regiment, motorized, towards Bosansky Petrovac, the command of the National Liberation Army of Yugoslavia orders a withdrawal from Durva, aiming to complete the evacuation before dawn to avoid airstrikes. Around six o'clock, the vanguard of the advancing Gruppa William, consisting of the 1st Company of the 373rd Croatian Infantry Division, encounters the rear of the 1st Battalion of the 3rd Lika Brigade in Kamenica. After a brief skirmish, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the Lika Brigade decide to retreat. By 10 o'clock, the leading elements of the Reconnaissance Battalion 373 arrive in Durva, providing relief to the remaining Fallschirmjäger. By noon, the rest of the Kampfgruppe, including the 373rd, Croatian Infantry Division, the 92nd Grenadier Regiment, Motorized, and Kampfgruppe William reach the area. They successfully drive the partisan forces out of Durva, marking a significant shift in the battle's dynamics. The 27th of May, 1944. Following the relief of the Fallschirmjäger in Durva, the 15th Geberg's Corps issues dispersal orders for the units in the region. The 92nd Grenadier Regiment, motorized, along with its subordinate units, is directed to head north and initiate an offensive against the brigades of the 4th Krajina Division on Mount Gomek. The operation, titled Unternehmen Gomek, aims to secure the vital supply route from Bihach to Bosansky Petrovac and is set to begin in the morning. Concurrently, the 373rd Croatian Infantry Division and the 1st Regiment of the Brandenburg Division are tasked with a sweep and destroy mission in the southern and southeastern areas around Durva in an operation named Unternehmen Vijanak. However, these efforts are thwarted as the 9th Dalmatian Division repels all attacks, pushing back the Brandenburgers and Chetnik forces towards Bosansko Grahovo. Meanwhile, 
the off clearing's obtailing 369 fails in its attempt to advance towards Glamok. Disappointed with the progress, General Oberst Lothar Rendulik decides to cancel Operations Gromek and Vianak in the afternoon. Instead, he instructs General Ernst von Leiser to regroup all units to their original positions for a coordinated assault on the suspected location of Tito and the headquarters of the 1st and 5th Proletarian Corps. This assault is planned for the morning of the 28th of May, 1944. Additionally, Rendulik sends the SS of Klärungsabteilung 105 to the Livno Glamok region, compensating for the Off Klärungsabteilung 369's failure to advance. The 31st of May, 1944. Lieutenant General Nikolai Vasilevich Kornev, head of the Soviet mission, suggests an air evacuation to rescue Tito and the Soviet mission. This proposal is expanded upon by the acting commander of the British military mission, Lieutenant Colonel Vivian Street, and it is decided to include the entire party, including all other Allied missions. Besides that, throughout their escape, the British mission keeps in constant radio communication with their headquarters, continuously calling for support from the Air Force against German units involved in Unternehmen Rösselsprung and Luftwaffe aircraft patrolling Yugoslavian skies. This results in more than a thousand Allied air missions. The 1st of June 1944. The Allied forces launch a significant ground offensive, codenamed Operation Flounced targeting the German-controlled Dalmatian island of Brack. The raid on Brack Island is swiftly organized and executed to alleviate pressure on Tito. This strategy aims to convince the Germans that the partisans intended to seize and maintain control of the island, possibly even preparing for a coastal landing. The goal of the operation is to prevent the Germans from sending additional forces from the coast to support Unternehmen Rüsselsprung. They also hope that this action will force the Germans to redirect their inland reserves to strengthen their coastal defences. The Allied forces participating in Operation Flounced includes the Yugoslavian 26th Dalmatia Division, minus two battalions of the 3rd Brigade, totaling approximately 1,300 men. They are transported and supported by 45 vessels. The British force consists of elements of the Highland Light Infantry, City of Glasgow Regiment, the reinforced British 43 Commando, supported by elements of the British 40 Commando and personnel from the Raiding Support Regiment, equipped with two captured Italian 47mm anti-tank guns. This assault force is ferried and supported by around 20 ships, including two destroyers and various landing craft. The operation, initiated from the British-held island of V in the Adriatic Sea, begins during the night of June 1, 1944. The troops start landing on the island of Brack and take their positions for the attack. The 2nd of June, 1944. The attack phase of Operation Flounced starts. At dawn, British aircraft attack German positions at Supertar, unleashing rockets from Hawker Hurricane fighter bombers. 43 commando attempts to take their target, known as Point 542, but is halted by a minefield and fails to capture a German observation post. The partisans assault their targets at Point 648 and 622 in the morning, and later target point 542. Another combined effort by the Highland Light Infantry and a partisan company also fails to seize the observation post, prompting Royal Air Force support, which eventually secures the position. The partisan attacks on points 648 and 622, preceded by air assaults, confront formidable mine and wire defences, though the partisans manage to overrun some outposts. 43 Commando faces similar challenges at point 542. The 3rd of June, 1944. Operation flounced continuous, however, 
Further nighttime partisan attacks prove unsuccessful. Reinforcements, including three troops from British No. 40 Commando, 300 partisans, and two 25-pounder gun howitzers, arrive overnight. In the east, partisans capture or kill a large number of Germans, effectively confining the remaining German forces to the town of Sumatin by noon. Faced with a resistant main German position, numbers 40 and 43 commandos plan an attack on the target known as Point 422 at dusk, with partisans harassing their targets at points 542 and 48. Due to communication issues, Novot 40 Commando misunderstands its orders, thinking it is to spearhead the attack with partisan support on its flanks. Number 43. Commando launches its attack at 2030 with artillery support and Bangalore torpedoes to clear the minefield. However, intense fire from both flanks and a German counterattack lead to their withdrawal. B Troop of Nuts 43 Commando, delayed by a suspected minefield, joins Num 40 Commando's assault, which reaches the objective, but then comes under heavy German fire. German troops overrun the position and capture 13 British soldiers, forcing the remainder of Number 40 Commando and B Troop of Number 43 Commando to withdraw to the start line, where they regroup with the rest of Number 43 Commando. Operation Flounced extends until the late hours of June 3, 1944, leading to additional German forces numbering 1,900 troops bolstering the island's defences. After enduring three days of intense skirmishes, the combined Allied forces withdraw back to V's. The partisans suffer considerable losses, with 67 fatalities, 308 injuries, and 14 soldiers missing in action. The Allied forces also face substantial casualties, including 60 fatalities, 74 injuries, and 20 missing personnel, with their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, being captured by German forces. On that very same day of June 3, 1944, after three days of discussion, Tito agrees to the evacuation plan. Lieutenant Colonel Street arranges for the evacuation from an airfield near the town of Cupres, operated by the Royal Air Force. Seven Douglas C-47 Skytrains, one with a Soviet crew and the rest with U.S. crews, transport Tito, his staff, the Allied military missions, and one 18 wounded partisans to Bari, Italy. The 6th of June, 1944. The German High Command officially concludes the conflict of the German forces involved in Unternehmen Rösselsprung with the Yugoslav People's Liberation Army in western Bosnia. The Allied Normandy landings on that very same day are likely to be part of that decision. In the late evening, the Royal Navy escort destroyer HMS Blackmore of the 60th Destroyer Division delivers Tito to Vis Island. There, he re-establishes his headquarters, and on June 9, 1944, he is joined again by the Allied military missions. This marks a significant turning point in the Yugoslav partisan resistance and solidifies Tito's position as a central figure in the fight against Axis forces in Yugoslavia. On June 17, 1944, the Treaty of Vis is being signed on the Dalmatian island of Vis, aiming to unite Tito's government with King Peter II's exiled government. Concurrently, the Balkan Air Force forms to primarily support Tito's forces. Winston Churchill meets with Tito in Naples on August 12, 1944, for a crucial discussion. By September 12, 1944, King Peter II was calling on all Yugoslavs to unite under Tito's leadership, labelling dissenters as traitors. Tito is now recognised by all Allied authorities, including the government in exile, as the Prime Minister of Yugoslavia and Commander-in-Chief of the Yugoslav forces. 
Stalin, aiming to address Western concerns about Eastern Europe's future, reluctantly orders Tito in a meeting in Moscow to permit King Peter's return to Yugoslavia. He advises Tito to slip a knife into his back at the appropriate moment, indicating potential betrayal. On September 28, 1944, an agreement between Tito and the Soviet Union allows the temporary entry of Soviet troops into Yugoslav territory, aiding operations in the northeastern areas. This external support enables the partisans to prepare and launch a massive general offensive. They successfully break through German lines, forcing a retreat beyond Yugoslav borders. Subsequently, all external forces are ordered off Yugoslav territory after the war. In the autumn of 1944, the communist leadership in Yugoslavia is making a political decision on the expulsion of ethnic Germans from the country. A special decree on November 21, 1944, orders the confiscation and nationalization of ethnic German property, and 70 camps are established across Yugoslav territory for implementation. Despite the war's end, King Peter II was not allowed to return home. Prime Minister Subasic, arriving in Belgrade in November 1944 and subsequently negotiating with Stalin in Moscow, agrees that Peter's return would be contingent upon a plebiscite determining whether Yugoslavia remains a monarchy or becomes a republic. Stalin also demands a three-man regency council to govern until the plebiscite. King Peter, now 21, protests this arrangement, particularly objecting to the Regency Council's composition, one Croat, one Slovene, and one Serb, all appointed by Tito and perceived as biased against him. As World War II in Yugoslavia draws to a close, partisan units are involved in atrocities during the Bleiberg repatriations, leading to accusations against the Yugoslav leadership under Tito. Tito is reportedly issuing multiple calls for surrender to the retreating forces, offering amnesty to avoid a disorderly surrender. On May 14, 1945, he dispatches a telegram to the Slovene Partisan Army's Supreme Headquarters, prohibiting the execution of prisoners of war and commanding the transfer of suspects to a military court. In March 1945, the Regency Council begins governing in Belgrade, while a new cabinet forms in what is now called the Democratic Federation of Yugoslavia. This government, though nominally a coalition, is predominantly communist, with non-communist ministers serving largely as a facade. The government attempts to freeze King Peter's foreign assets, alleging theft. Meanwhile, Tito and Peter engage in mutual denunciation, with Tito claiming to foster democracy and Peter accusing him of establishing a communist dictatorship. In the November 1945 elections for the Constituent Assembly, allegations of voting fraud and intimidation arise, with opposition newspapers stifled by the government. Finally, King Peter is deposed by Yugoslavia's Communist Constituent Assembly on the 29th of November, 1945, and Yugoslavia is declared a republic. In the years to follow, Josip Broz Tito ends up to be the sole leader of the Republic of Yugoslavia. He served as the Prime Minister from the 2nd of November 1944 to the 29th of June 1963 and as President of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia from the 14th of January 1953 until his death on the 4th of May 1980. As we reach the end of our episode on special forces in World War II, focusing particularly on Operation Russellsprung, it is time to reflect on the key takeaways from this intense and pivotal military campaign. Unternehmen Russellsprung stands as a testament to the brutality and unpredictability of warfare. The 15th Geburgs Corps, a key player in the operation, suffered significant losses, 
amounting to 1,145 casualties, including 213 fatalities and 881 wounded. This heavy toll underscores the fierce resistance met by the Axis forces. The SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500 faced a staggering 71% casualty rate, losing 576 out of 874 soldiers, a figure that starkly illustrates the risks and sacrifices inherent in special operations. Despite these considerable losses, the primary objective of Unternehmen Rösselsprung, the capture of Josip Broz Tito, was not achieved. This failure not only represented a tactical setback for the Axis forces, but also had strategic implications. Tito's successful evasion and continued leadership played a crucial role in maintaining the strength and morale of the Yugoslav partisans. According to a source from the partisan side, their total losses during the conflict were significant, amounting to 399 killed, 479 wounded, and at least 85 individuals reported as missing. Notably, a significant portion of these casualties occurred in the direct engagement with the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500 at Dervar. In this specific confrontation, the partisans suffered 179 fatalities, 63 wounded and 19 missing in action. This engagement was evidently one of the more fierce and costly battles for the partisans. The figures, particularly those associated with the battle at Durva, demonstrate the high level of resistance and determination exhibited by the partisans, even when faced with elite units like the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500. Despite being outnumbered and often outgunned, the partisans' ability to inflict substantial casualties on a highly trained and well-equipped enemy unit like the SS Fallschirmjäger Bataillon 500 is indicative of their resolve and combat effectiveness. In the broader context of World War II, these numbers add to the understanding of the scale of sacrifice and resilience on the part of the Yugoslav partisans. Their resistance played a crucial role in the larger Allied effort against Axis forces in Europe. The losses sustained by the Allied units in this operation reflect the intense and dangerous nature of the conflict. The number of wounded and missing personnel also highlights the challenges faced by the Allied forces in maintaining their combat effectiveness in the face of a formidable and well-equipped enemy. In conclusion, Unternehmen Rüsselsprung underscores the complexities and challenges inherent in special military operations, particularly within the dynamic and multifaceted battlefields of World War II. It also exemplifies the resilience of resistance movements and the difficulties involved in suppressing them, even with meticulously planned and heavily resourced military endeavors. Moreover, it can be viewed as marking the beginning of Tito's leadership over the soon-to-be Republic of Yugoslavia. As we bring this episode to a close, we reflect on the intense and tumultuous events of Unternehmen Rüsselsprung. This operation, marked by its bold ambitions and dramatic execution, stands as a pivotal moment in the history of Special Forces operations during World War II. In our journey through Part 2, we witnessed the unfolding of the German airborne raid aimed at capturing or eliminating Josip Broz Tito. Despite their meticulous planning and deployment of elite troops, the German forces encountered fierce resistance from Tito's partisans. The rugged terrain of Dürvar provided a challenging battlefield where strategies, bravery and the will to survive clashed with brutal force. Ultimately, the operation did not achieve its primary objective. Tito eluded capture, and the partisan command structure remained intact. The resilience and determination of the partisans, coupled with the strategic missteps of the German forces, led to an outcome that was both unexpected and significant. 
Unternehmen Resselsprung serves as a testament to the complexities of warfare, where even the most well-planned operations can face unforeseen challenges and results. It highlights the unpredictable nature of conflict and the indomitable spirit of those fighting for their cause. As we conclude this two-part series, we are reminded of the courage, sacrifices, and strategic intricacies that define the narratives of World War II. This operation, with its blend of intelligence, bravery, and tactical gambits, offers a compelling chapter in the annals of military history. Thank you for joining us on this historical exploration on the Special Forces in World War II podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes where we delve into the untold stories and remarkable operations of Special Forces in World War II. This mission briefing, fellow warriors of knowledge. We've navigated through the trenches of information, delving deep into the battlefields of history. As we wrap up this episode in our campaign for understanding, remember that knowledge is your most potent weapon. Stay vigilant and keep sharpening your intellectual arsenal. We'll rendezvous again for another episode, continuing our relentless pursuit of enlightenment. Until then, keep your mind sharp, your curiosity burning, and your determination unwavering. Simultaneously, you are hereby alerted to our outposts on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, fortifying our information dissemination. Should you possess any pertinent intelligence to bolster our mission, transmit your findings with no hesitation. Your contributions shall be prominently acknowledged within the operational archives, Furthermore, for those prepared to provide substantial reinforcement, navigate to our Patreon forward base and enlist. Your support is integral to sustaining our forward thrust. Carry forth the legacy. Dismissed. <laughs>